All right, let's get started. Um, uh, the title of this talk is Identification of Subfamily and Chibe of the, of the Coronamid Larvae in California. And uh, why are we doing this session? Okay, the first reason is the, the new California Stream Condition Index that was developed by uh, Peter Ode, Andy Wren, and Rafi Mazur for uh, California requires your coronamids are determined to subfamily in order to use it. Um, and that's not part of SAFET level one or SAFET level two at this present. So this is kind of a supplement in order to be able to use this new stream index. And the other reason that we want to present this is that if you're going to start IDing your midges to SAFET level two, this is basically the first step you would want to take with your midges, is sorting them into, into, these, into these subfamilies and, and tribes uh, for, for certain, for certain uh, subfamilies. So um, the procedure that we're going to talk about is um, written up in the uh, most recent uh, SOP for BMI. Uh, laboratory macroinvertebrate identification, and there's a link here which will get you to um, the, the website where you can download a copy of this SOP. And the section we're going to be talking about is section 4.3, identification and enumeration of coronamids, and this is basically the first couple of steps. Uh, one caveat for this training is that Brady and I are going to assume that you already have a working knowledge of the external morphology of coronamids. Um, so we're going to go over characters pretty fast in the, in the, um, in the presentation, and then we're going to go under the scope. We're going to show you what to start looking for. Um, having said that, um, if you, these are the basic references for, coronam, for doing coronamid taxonomy. And these references all contain information on how to on the external morphology that you need to know. Um, the first reference is basically the Coronamid chapter in Merritt and Cummins, and most people have a copy of that. Um, another another good reference is Epler 2001, which it's the identification manual for the larvae of Coronamids for North and South Carolina, but for doing subfamily, um, this is still good. And uh, and this is actually an excellent. This is this is one of the best references to have. And even if you're in California, you should have a copy of this. It's free, and you can download it from uh, you can download it in PDF format from this site. And the other reference that you need is uh, uh, Volume One of Wiederholm, 1983, which contains keys and diagnoses to all of the coronamids in the whole Arctic region. And one thing we'd like to mention is when Brady and I are working and everybody at ABL, even to genus level, we use these three references pretty much constantly all together. Um, if we have midges, if we have a chronomid that we're, we, we question, we will, we will key it in two or sometimes even three of these references and then check against the diagnoses in Wiederholm and um, Epler also contains a lot of diagnostic information where you can compare it against. So it, 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 it behooves you to obtain all three of these if you can. Okay. Um, this slide is basically, it just lists um, in North America all of the subfamilies and tribes of coronamids uh, that, that are commonly recognized. Uh, we're not going to cover all of these taxa, though. The taxa that we're going to we're going to talk about is uh, these taxa, which are commonly collected in stream BMI samples in the weightable streams that we collect here in California. Uh, and these these are these are basically the most common taxa that uh, you're going to see in weightable stream samples throughout the West. Okay. Uh, And at that, I guess we'll just jump right into it. we'll just jump right into talking about each of the subfamilies. And we're only going to cover these three these three tribes 
um, within the Chironomenae. Um, we're not going to talk about uh, there are there are, there are tribes in some of these other groups, but when you get into the the sub the tribes within these groups, you're already getting into uh, a level of taxonomy where you might as well go to genus. Um, these three are recognized in a lot of the bioassessment literature is being ecologically significant. Okay, the Chironomenae, and I'm going to go kind of fast here, but when we get underneath the microscope, we're going to we're going to talk about characters that you can see underneath the dissecting microscope and people can ask questions then. Um for the Chironomenae, they're basically they're defined as um they have a, they have a mentum, and they have well-defined mentum and the antennae are non-retractile. Uh, they don't have a tooth ligula, and the ventral mental plates are well developed with conspicuous striations throughout more than half their width, and they're found in nearly all the BMI samples that we collect in California. Um, so the Chironomenae, there are three tribes within the Chironomenae that you'll need to learn how to, how to ID. And the first one is the Tani Tarsini. Uh, Tani tarsines are really, really common. Probably get them. We probably get you get some kind of tani tarsini in every sample you collect. Um, the antennae for the tani tarsini arise from a distinct tuber, tubercle that comes off the head. Uh, ventral mental plates are usually narrow and elongate in most of the genera, and the lateral-borne organs are very large and conspicuous, or they occur at the apex of elongated stalks. The chironomini, the antennae, don't arise from a distinct tubercle. The ventral mental plates are larger and variously shaped and well striated, not narrow and elongate like Tani Tarsini. There's one exception is the stenochironomus, um, which lacks ventral mental plates but possesses a distinct mentum. It's not really that common in California. Um, we'll ha we, I have one underneath the microscope that I'll show you. Uh, and Chironomini, their latter born organs are inconspicuous. The pseudochironomini, um, this uh, tribe, if you identify it to this tribe, you've essentially identified it. it it's a genus. There's only one genus, the pseudochironomus, in North America. Um, it's characterized by having long, narrow, elongated ventral mental plates, which look like tani tarsinis in combination with an antenna that does not rise, arise from a tubercle on top of the head, which is like a chironomini. And another good character for underneath the dissecting scope that, is, uh, is, that I'll show you later, um, they have posterior parapods that uh, they form a dense crochet-like set of claws. Uh, and this will be on the ventral side on the last segment. And also, when you get them in your samples, you'll often find them in loosely constructed tubes of silk and very fine detritus. Okay, the next subfamily, Orthocladiinae. Again, they they have antennae that are non-retractile. Uh, they don't have a tooth ligula. Uh, they're they have a mentum, and it's, they have a, 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 a nice, well-formed mentum, usually dark and sclerotized. Uh, the ventral mental plates are typically vestigial. Sometimes they're well-developed, but when they're well-developed, um, they never possess striations, and they're usually well-developed. They cover some of the teeth on the mentum. Uh, these uh, the, the uh, coronamids in this subfamily are common in California, and they're found in nearly all of our BMI samples. I would say they're probably found in all of our BMI samples. Okay, the Tanipodinae. Um, the Tanipodinae are characterized by having retractile antennae, which means that sometimes they'll be sticking out, and sometimes they, they suck them right into their heads, so you'll see, uh, you'll see coronamids in your dish that don't, don't really have any apparent antennae. Um, they have a, a, a 48 tooth ligula present, which, make, which makes them, you know, different than all the others. Um, their mentum is membranous and not obvious. 
um, or if it has any kind of sclerotized structure, uh, the dorsal mental teeth, that will have dorsal mental teeth which are arranged in a conspicuous plate or a longitudinal row. This, tax, the, this subfamily is common, but it's rarely the dominant tax inside your sample, and that's because tanypodes, for the most part, are predatory, so, um, and they feed on other chronomids. So, you know, you can't have too many tigers in the forest, or they will starve. Okay, uh, I'm going to pause here, take a drink of soda. Uh, the, the, the subfamilies I went o just went over, these are the most common ones and the ones you're going to see in almost every single sample. The next three subfamilies are a bit rarer. Okay, so the first of these is the diamizinae. Um, it looks similar to an orthoclatinae, but more robust in appearance, typically large, and typically they're larger specimens than any of the orthoclads you'll see in the same sample. Um, the antennae, the, the, the third segment of the antennae is annulated. Um, you typically can't see that underneath the dissecting scope unless it's a really, really large specimen, and you get really lucky. Uh, this subfamily, the Diamizinae, are more common in cold water and high elevation streams. Um, in, mo in a lot of our BMI samples, you, you'll see these, what do you say, Brady, probably 80% of the time in good, good, good sites? Something like that. About 80% of the time you'll see some, but you, you rarely see lots and lots and lots of these. Um, very occasionally, you will. Um, the next uh, 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 subfamily is the Prodiamizinae, and within this within this subfamily, there are only three genera. Um, there's the Prodiamiza and the Odontomiza, which possess a uh, very large, long, distinctive CD coming off of their mentons. Um, and they look like cat whiskers to me. Uh, and uh, they're typically found in cold, high elevation streams in California, and they're not commonly collected. Um, we've got, we've, we did a search of our database, and we did not come up with uh, maybe 20 or 30 incidences. Um, the other, the other genus um, doesn't have the long cat-like whiskers. It's monodiamiza. It occurs mostly in profundal zones in oligotrophic lakes. It's rarely found in streams. We have some that we'll show you underneath the microscope that we collected up in the, high, up in the Sierra in high elevation. Um, it's kind of a distinctive critter, too. And finally, the last subfamily is the Podonominae. Um, they possess long, distinctive procercae, easily seen under the dissecting scope. And we have a couple of these guys we'll show you. They also have antennal segments, uh, anten an antennal segment three that appears annulated. Um, but the uh, but diamesins never have a pro uh, procercae like this. Um, and these guys are found in cold, high altitude streams in California. The larvae are often associated with mosses, and they're very, very rarely collected in our BMI samples. Um, so, a couple of things to remember while we're while you're working on your um, on your samples. Uh, nearly all samples that you're going to collect in California will contain. Chironomenae, Orthocladineanae, and Tanipodinae. Diamizinae can occur in samples from anywhere in the state, but rarely in large numbers. Um, and in California samples from cold water and high altitude, you may get Prodiamizinae and Podinomenae. 
And by a high altitude, I mean, you know, 5,000 feet or above. So now we're going to get ready to uh, uh, move over to the microscope. Okay, here we have a sample. This is not a, uh, not a real sample. What we did is we went through a bunch of our reference specimens and a composite sample that contains uh, the, all, all of the subfamilies that we were talking about previously. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to work my way through here and I'm going to show you uh, the various subfamilies and basically how you would how you would handle working with one of these samples. Focus. Okay. Typically what I would do is the first subfamily that I find the easiest to pull to pull out are the Tanipodinae. Here we have several tanny podes. Okay, we were talking about you know them having or uh, have the tanny podes are the only gene or the only subfamily that has retractile antennae. And here you can see. Um, this guy has his antenna retracted. You can just barely see the tip there. Here we have a good example. Here are two. These two tanny podes are in the same genus. And you can actually see, you can see the retracted, it, the, 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 the deployed antenna, and then on the other specimen, you can see the retracted antenna, and you can actually, can you see the, you can right. see the antenna inside the head capsule there. Also, if you look at the bottom of the head, they don't have a distinct dark and mentum. Uh, just for comparison's sake, I'm swing over here. Grab this guy. that can you see that darkened structure there on the bot ventral side of the head that Brady's pointing to that's a mentum and none of the tatting points will have that uh, typically most of the tanning podes have a, a bullet shaped head They usually have uh, long posterior parapods with claws on them. It is usually bullet shaped. You want to add, Brady? Uh, <coughs> focusing on the, the one uh, planetanipus and showing the prothoracic organ developing. Oh, right. This right here is an example of a really valuable specimen. 
the pupae is starting to develop inside the larval skin. And that right there is the pro prothoracic horn. And in a pupa, that is very diagnostic to genus and uh, even sometimes species. Sure. Um, sometimes you, if you can't identify the larva, you can identify you can identify it based on that structure alone. Those are any kind of specimen like that are always worth saving, putting in your reference collection. Okay, so. What I do next is once I collect all my tanny pods, I remove them from the dish. And I put I put them in a vial. Mark tanny pod in A. And if I was gonna do level two taxonomy, then I would come after I sort everything out, then I go back uh, to one vial at a time by subfamily and I would start working on identifying those for genus. Okay. The next group I'll talk about are the Chironomine, Chironomini. Okay, this is a this is a uh, a Chironomin in the sub in the tri subfamily Chironomine. In the uh, in the tribe, Chironomini, and typically the Chironomini and the Tani Tarsini, even the Pseudo Chironomini, you see those eye spots? They're like one up above another. Um, those will help help you put it into the proper uh, proper subfamily. Um, point to the, just point that one out, just, yeah, that character right, was that? Uh, the foramen occipital. Yeah, that's characteristic to, to generic IDs. Um, let's, I gotta try and get them so we can see the mentum and the ventral mental plate here. Point to the mentum and okay. tell them what it is. Okay, so there's the mentum. A little bit out of focus. I'm trying. Yeah. Yeah, this is a big midge, but it's still pretty difficult to, to get it exactly centered and, and immovable, showing the, the structure and still have it in focus. So hopefully it will show up for you folks. So the dark structure in the center is the mentum. Then off to the side. I'm trying. Yeah, I know. Hold on, let me let me try to get it in a better position. Okay, so this structure off to the side of the mentum is a ventromental plate, and I don't think there's any way we can show the striations, you know, with this setup. No. Um, that's, this is a chironome, 
That's a Kyra no Mini. Okay, this is going to be hard to see because they're really small. These? Microsector first. Huh? Let's go to the microsector in the middle first. Can you, can, yeah. can you point out that? Yeah. Two okay, again? so we've got the, the Mintum again. We've got the eye spots one on top of the other again, just like in the Carnamini. But here, a little tough to see, but you've got this nice little pedestal there, that, or a tubercle that the uh, antennae arise from. You kind of see it on the other side as well. And then longer antennae. There are some uh, carnamini that have long antennae, but other structures will uh, help separate them from the tiny tarsini. Okay, so here. Let me, let me try and get that uh, tubercle in focus on this guy. Can you see the tubercle there? Yeah, it's going to be difficult to, to see, I think. But okay. you, we can see the tubercle here again. This is a different uh, genus than the one we were just showing you. And hopefully we can get the, the antennae a little bit better in focus. I mean, they're, they're longer, but you can, for this genus, you can really see the uh, louder born organs. Yeah. Okay, let me change the angle of the light here. Yeah, so this, this thickened portion on the end, those are actually louder born organs. They stick out, you know, from uh, both sides of the, the antenna there. I can Getting better? Mm. No, it, it is better the first time. Okay, let's try another specimen. Okay. We got a lot here. Here's a stem pelinella. That That'll show the... Tubercles are shot really good. Yeah, for this, so for this genus, it has a very elongate tubercle, and you know it looks like the head's kind of excised right there. This is a really easy to identify midge, and usually we kind of separate those off, you know, by themselves as we're doing the Tani Tarsini. They also have, you know, the very large louder born organs. Apologies, we know that these aren't going to show up perfectly here, but. Uh, hopefully this will give you an idea as you're looking at your own specimens and you have your, your literature in front of you, you know, to, uh, to look at these characters more closely. Okay, let's find some more. Let's find some more Tanitar scenes. As you can see with some of these specimens that Joe's moving around, one of the problems is you're going to have, you know, varying rates of maturity amongst your specimens. And that's really a pain with the Taney Tarsini if you're taking them past the uh, uh, tribe level. Okay, here we have a couple more Taney Tarsini. Wanted to show you this, the Rio Tarsus and its case, and these tendrils on the case are diagnostic for the genus. Here is one of the more common of the Tani Tarsines. Sure. 
you can see the tubercle again, very long antennal uh, stock there, and you can see the, the louder borns are actually on elongated stalks as well. I can flip him over. One of these microsector he had really nice. The louder ones were spread out. This might not be as Another tandy tarsine with long or with long antenna. There's a good shot of the tubercles, Brady. Yeah. You can see the tubercles really well here. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention, if you notice, like on the tandy tarsines too, all of them, their bodies in general, are pretty soft and squishy. And they seem to tend to have the the segment intersegments tend to be very much deeper than a lot of the other pteranomids. And in general, you probably picked up on that they tend to be smaller than everybody else. A couple more attendees are seen. get a reference on how small they are compared to some of the other guys. Another one with long antenna, another tiny tarsine. Can we see the ventral mental plates? Uh, yeah. Joe? Yes. Yeah, we have a uh, chat question that came in. Okay. It says that the segments are more deeply pronounced in uh, Tani Tarsini. Yeah, they, that, that they seem like to me. Um, the, you know, the, the inner segmental pinching has always seemed like it's a little bit more pronounced on the Tani Tarsini to me than like on the Chironomini. That's just a general impression. Joe's just trying to organize these to make it a little more efficient. Here's uh, two prodiamesins side by side in two different genera. The one on the, the, the left is prodiamesa. Okay. Oh, oh, that, oh okay. The one on your left or your right is it's flipped. Um, so the one on the right is prodiamesa, the one on the left is monodiamesa. And you 
you can see they both have both both genera in this in this subfamily they have fairly small eye spots. That'll help tip you off that you know they're not one of the other subfamilies. Um and I was talking about the cat whiskers. You should be able to see these pretty good. It's actually a pretty small specimen. Yeah, this is a really small specimen. Can you get those in focus? Are they good? Okay, so you, yeah, so the base of the whiskers. Off screen there. Well, I'm having a hard time holding it. So small. Okay, so yeah, you can see the whiskers here very easily. The, Couple good thick ones on the right there, and you can see the, the whole tuft on the left. And the, the mintum is very distinctive for this critter, too. One of the problems with the Prodiamazony is you've got the three genera, and literally in the keys, the, they key out does it look like this, then it's this genus. Does it look like this, then it's this genus. All right. So it's difficult to, to have characters. It's basically. Does it look like this? Then you got it. Here's monodiamazin. Now you can see that this guy doesn't have big long whiskers. You're probably catching on by now that actually the most difficult part about colonomid taxonomy has got nothing to do with the taxonomy. It has to do with the fact that these critters are all so small that they're, get, they're very, very difficult to manipulate in order to see what you need to see. Okay. Go next, Brady. I think whatever you see. Um uh, there, I would do the orthoclads. Yeah, well, let's do the orthoclads before we do the diamazin A. Yeah. Oh, wait, is that a pseudoclonus? Yay, we found pseudoclonus. Sorry about we're jumping around like this, but okay. Pseudocoronimus is the last uh, last tribe in the uh, the, uh, in the subfamily Carinomine. and go ahead. Can you show me the, those mental plates? Yeah. So it's it's very easy to see the the very narrow and wide ventromental plates either side of the mentum there. And that's basically what the in the ventromental plates for most of the Tani Tarsini will look like too. And you can see that like antennae don't have any they don't arise from any tubercles. Can you see that? Yeah. How's that feel? And then one of the characters I use a lot that's not necessarily in the books see these claws on the posterior parapods? They got a lot of claws down there. That's to hold themselves inside their tube. They almost look like a big comb of claws. Did I lose you it? lost it, yeah. Okay. Hold on, let me See those, those claws there? They're on the posterior parapods. And if you have any question if what you're looking at, if you're looking at the, the head and you think you, think you see the, the narrow mental plates and you, you're pretty sure there's no tubercle but you're still questioning, take a look at this character because this is kind of a dead giveaway.
Okay. Start looking at the ortho clouds. We're going to look at, this is probably the easiest ortho clad to identify. Um, this is in the subfamily ortho clad DNA. And you can ID these guys to Krakotopus nostococola basically just by the fact that they they take nostoc algae and they form these little ear-like nodules that they live in. And their head capsules usually range from this, this dark brown to almost black. Let's see if we can. Hold him in place to see that. Trouble holding him. Charges. I'll point out the eye spots and talk about okay. the eye spots. Okay. Um, so here, you got two eye spots again. They're not one on top of the other. They tend to be, you know, to the side or, you know, slightly oblique. That's a, another good quick and dirty character to separate your orthoclads from your carnamines. Uh, it's, it's tough to see the the other one that's in the the nostoc bud, but but he's in there. You'll also see. I mean, sometimes you'll get multiple. Right there. Yeah. Sometimes you'll get multiple specimens in a, a nostoc bud, or usually what you see are the uh, the previous uh, larval instar exuvi. You can see the whole life cycle of this critter within one nostoc bud. There's a good okay. shot of the eye spots. Okay, so we're at the, the limits of what we can do here, but yeah, okay, there. All right, sorry. That's fine. All right, I can pull out. I'm going to pull out some more orthoclads. Another good example of an orthoclad. Again, you got two eye spots. Here they're they're almost merged, but still not on top of each other, but one in front of the other and slightly lower. And that's really characteristic is that slightly oblique little smaller eye spot. You have a nice sclerotized mentum. Uh, they're really difficult to see the ventral mental plates, especially on this uh, this taxon. Mandibles are usually nice and sclerotized. This one is just kind of nice because you have uh, a darker apical portion, so you can see the the teeth really well when you're trying to uh, do generic ID. That's brilliant, by the way. It's a wood borer. I'm going to put up the Dionysia. Okay. Just for comparison. Yeah. It's an orthoclad. That was a good. Okay. That was orthoclad DNA. This is a Diamesian A. Now, superficially, you, they're going to look a lot alike. But where Brady's showing it, they tend to have really, really heavily sclerotized sclerotization at the back of the head capsule. Um, these guys tend to be really big. I'm just going to back them off. And uh, relationship. Here's another diamesian A.
and you can see the heavy sclerotization at the back of the head capsule. Um, telling the difference when you first start out between the orthoclaw DNA and the diamesonae is going to be a little bit difficult. And what we would suggest is when you're going through your stuff and you start sorting them, sort everything kind of by these these eye spots, and you'll end up with, you know, your diamesins and orthoclaw DNA, orthoclaw DNA together, and then go back through them and separate them out to learn, you know, learn how the diamesins are different. How are we on time? Let's uh, find the photo nominee. Okay. One we haven't talked about yet. Um, or actually, show the boreal. Yeah, yeah, here's the boreal heptagia. This right here is probably one of the easiest ones to identify. It's really tough to, to see if you can change the angle of the light or get more light. How's that? That's a little better. There, oh, yeah. Yeah, so for this genus, it's really cool because there are all these really funky head tubercles. Leave there and try to bring it to focus. There you go. Yeah. So you see, there are two or three on either side of the head. That's a. It's a really distinctive genus. So that's a, a really gimme for the the subfamily Diamazini. Uh, you do have to be careful. There is a, a similar looking critter in a different family, but in the Familiidae. So this doesn't. Uh, you know, just because you see the tubercles doesn't mean you can go directly to this subfamily or even this genus. You do have to make sure that you have a midge, a chironomid midge, that is. So the last one we're looking for is the, the subfamily Podonomini. Like Joe said, this is one that is found in uh, very high, kind of high elevation streams, usually smaller ones, the ones where we've the, the stream where we found these was basically a, an ephemeral stream. By the time you know June rolls around, all the, the snows melted off, it's gone. But this subfamily has there are differences in the the, the mentum shape and all that, and antennal segments. All right. Let's look at the head first. Look at that head, and that looks a lot like an orthoclatinae, the eye spots on that head. But turn them around, show them that long procercial. Yeah, this is diagnostic for the uh, the subfamily Podonomini, the the very long uh, procercus. Uh, if you're going to go past subfamily, you have to look at like uh, the, the coloration of it, whether it's dark anteriorly or posteriorly. We won't get into all that, but this is a really nice character. Uh, there are some tiny pods that have a procerci like this, but you're going to separate them out based on other characters. Yeah. Um, one thing is this: these specimens, this genus right here, is probably the hardest one to actually see this character on too. Most of the other podium that's even more obvious. Let me find the other one. That was the one that had it broken off. Another better podium specimen. There he is. Yeah. So for this one, it has both procerci present. Looking from the ventral side there, you can see them going away in the other direction. 
Sometimes when you're manipulating these things, they uh, kind of don't want to go where you want them to go. <laughs> I think this is probably the, the rarest of the, the subfamilies of yeah. the midges in California. Uh, like I said, we've only encountered them, you know, really infrequently. Yeah. Uh, our Lake Davis project, we got uh, a number of these. We actually got uh, three genera up there. and was told by Peter Cranston that one of those was was probably noteworthy. There were only a very few specimens known from that thing. Okay. How are we for time? Okay. I'm going to show them Steno Coronimus first. Okay. okay. In the talk, we were talking about the one chironome Chironomini that doesn't look like any of the others. Pretty much this guy doesn't really look like anything else. This is Stenochronomus. Yeah, this is, he's a beast. Just okay, just, yeah. He's moving. He's moving on his own. Um, they're characteristic by having, like, um, kind of have this skinny, uh, kind of soft, not well, uh, not, not, not well developed body, but in comparison to like having this big, thick head, the head's usually bigger than the body, isn't it? You yeah. say? Yeah. Wider? Much, yeah. And these guys are wood bor borers, so they have uh, very well developed mandibles and mentum. They basically, they chew their way through rotten wood. And they're not collected very often because a lot of times they're probably in a piece of like rotten wood inside your sample and you just, you know, don't get them out of there. Um, for comparison, this is my favorite orthoclad, which is called Brillia, and it's a wood borer too. Out, knock their block off. Perfect. The reason why it's my favorite orthoclad is it's so easy to identify. That mention is very distinctive. There you can see the big dark and mention, the median teeth. Can you see the ventral mental plates on there? You really can't. But they would be off on the side here. Okay, we've um we've gone through all of the subfamilies at this point. What I've got left in here are various uh Examples of, diff uh, of of the same same subfamilies. Here's a Chironomini. See that this one's much smaller than the ones we showed you earlier. Again, he's got the two head spots, two eye spots, one over the other. This is a very very common genus in the Central Valley. This is Dicrotendipes. Can we see the? You can see it's got the sclerotized mentum. mentum. I'm going to knock his head off too so we can show them the ventral plates. Okay. We should have just like started lock, lopping heads off earlier. Don't worry, folks. It doesn't feel any pain at all. I'm 
Is that on the screen? No, it's, it's okay. You see the momentum pretty well. Can't really see the instrumental plates though. Let me see if I can move them a little bit. They're shining. The MPs are shiny right now. There you go. Can you see those? Can you see they're that? they're not in focus for us. Okay. They're okay. There. So you can see. Could see. So there's one there. Uh, tough to see the other one. Focus through. Uh, you see? Or am I blurry? They're, that's about the best right there. It's tough to see. You, uh, I don't have the range for me. Focus is really, really narrow. The depth of field at yeah. this magnification is very, very small. About as good as you can get. Okay. You should like unmute it and give him a quiz now. Actually, here's a one of the super easiest chironomini. Polypedalum. There's actually two eye spots, and they touch. Those are two separate eye spots stacked one on top of another. That's a Chironomenae and the tribe Chironomini. Let's try lopping that head off real fast. Okay. But we should really wrap it up. All right. Okay, you can see the base of the VMP right there, that little triangular structure. The, the, what Joe was saying about this being a real super easy one is most of the polypedalum have the, the two center teeth sticking out, so it's the buck tooth midge. Okay, um, at this point, Folks want to start ask want to ask us questions or send them to Eric or Joe. Is it okay if they unmute themselves and ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, to unmute your phone, just press star six. Ask a question. Uh, put yourself back on mute by pressing star six. Since we don't have any questions, uh, Brady, do you want to check your chat box, see if you've been... Uh, hey, Eric, any? is anybody there? Can anybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. This is Larry Chavanti. I was I missed the name on the uh, the orthoclad and the nostoc. Oh, Cricotopus nostococola. Oh, that's a Cricotopus. Okay. Yes. There's, on that, there's, there's actually some debate whether there's a second species that will invade the nostoc. And uh, we've talked with Peter Cranston. He was going to look into that. He never got back to me, so I'm not sure if that's really been you know, determined or not. It was mentioned in a paper that came out a number of years ago. Uh, so I think that you know, one of the things we may do, like for our SAPA Level 2 stuff, is uh, back it off to subgenus. So just record it as Cricotobus nostococladius. 
but we were showing that one as a, a really quick and easy uh, critter that you can move into your uh, orthoclidiony pile uh, without having to do a lot of work on it. Yeah, I, I've seen it quite a bit in samples, and I always wondered who it was. It's really... The head's so dark, even clearing it sometimes, I couldn't get to see the inside of it. It's really common in the Sierras. Yeah. And you can just pick those little ears off of rocks. Yeah, that was my question. Thanks. Okay.